Hello, everybody. Welcome to RDA Tech Q&A, where uh, you have questions, we have guesses. Um, I am Nash. I've been doing RDA for a long, long time. But before that, I used to be a tech repair builder monkey. It's my job. I had a little hat. With me is Mike Gehrman, my producer. He does a whole lot of tech stuff in his everyday today life. Um, we'll be answering your tech questions if you have some issues you think we might be able to help you with. God help you. Um, but uh, if you do, send those to requests at radio.air.com. We will attempt to fix the things, if at all possible. And we've got some tonight that are just... Fuck. Yeah, I saw those questions. It's the kind of tech question you get where all you can do is just go, fuck. Fuck. Because yeah. that's 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 your best option. But first, let's talk a little bit about the news. And of course, this week, Jesus H. Pokemon, 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 Pokemon. And I'll say this: I have found Zubats to be the hardest to catch because they flutter all over the fucking screen. But I haven't caught very many yet. Oh, uh, all right. Let let's let me start by saying. Yes, I've played it, and it is one of the most harmless, inoffensive little games on the surface. It's fun. It's entertaining. I can see why everybody is so excited about it. It's a whole lot. It, it, it's big. Yes. But there are some issues, especially issues that are going to be important going forward. Let, let's start with the impact that Pokemon Go has had on gaming. Uh, Allison and I were discussing this today. Um, Allison, uh, Obscure Salupa, she, she, she is not really sold on VR, which is virtual reality. It's the $600 headset and camera and crazy and, nonsense. And lie there and play video games with a $600 headset rather than a $600 video card. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that she's not sold on it, but she does see the appeal of Pokemon Go. And I, I, I pointed out... It's causing nerds to get exercise. Well, it's that. But VR requires a really, currently, a pretty expensive buy-in in terms yes. of hardware. Um, that's not even counting the, the cost of games, which, you know, that's, that's a regular thing. But the buy-in on the hardware is the tough sell right now. I yeah. mean, uh, $600 hardware plus the computer to, to run that hardware. Which some require upgrades. Um, it's, yeah, it's, I, I couldn't run out of my computer. It's one of those where VR has a barrier to entry in the form of the hardware. Whereas AR, at least in terms of mobile gaming. And by the way, AR is augmented reality for yeah. those of you paying attention at home. Yeah, virtual reality is where you put you can see nothing of the real world. You are immersed in another world entirely in a full 3D experience kind of thing. And you're and you're probably not walking around because that'd be much more dangerous. Yes, AR is augmented reality. It's where you overlay a game on top of the real world. And in terms of a buy-in, everybody has an AR device in their pocket in the form of a smartphone. It's a cheap way to put forth an AR platform because smartphones just keep getting more faster and more complicated. They have more storage. They have more. They're becoming complete. Shorter battery life. Shorter battery life. They're becoming more complete computers in their own right. And people already possess them. That means AR is more likely, at least in the near term, to be a platform of choice for publishers because it's quick money everybody's got the platform already you just yeah. push out the game to them and pokemon and if, and if you tie in with someone like niantic who already has all the maps and all the key points mapped out hmm. they can just go you know uh, you walk up to a place you're going oh you're playing pokemon and they go no i'm playing dungeons and dragons go or i'm playing fallout go which would scare me however that does bring up we'll get to those problems in a second but in terms of in terms of gaming, Pokemon Go is AR's Pac-Man. Yes, it, this is the, everyone loved Pac-Man. Uh, there were songs about Pac-Man. Yep, they were on the radio. 
They reached the top 10. Yeah, I remember. A so song, song about a disco duck, so. Song about Pac-Man was in the top 10 on the U.S. Billboard charts at one point. Mike, what did you eat? That would be my neighbor on one of his motorcycles. One of? What was this song called? Pac-Man Fever. It's, yeah. It is a real thing. Pac-Man... You may see it on Radio Dead Air this Monday. Pac-Man took over in terms of the... Amer it, it exploded. Oh, yeah, now, you, you, you would have... Okay, so for those of you who are a bit younger, there used to be these things called video arcades <laughs> where you'd have these great big consoles. I mean, we're talking you know, taller than a person. You'd walk up. Think Dance Dance Revolution, but for other games. Uh, and there'd be video arcades that would have multiple Pac-Man games because they'd need multiple Pac-Man games and they'd still have a line of people waiting to play Pac-Man. Yep. It was it, it was amazing. And Pokemon Go has had the same cultural impact. So I can honestly see what happened after Pac-Man was the arcade scene exploded. There yeah, were there's Donkey Kong, there was Galaga, Galaga Centipede, all the was that one where you sort of it was a it was a wireframe thing you sort of spun around a central point shooting things. Um, I forget. Yeah, I liked playing that one. I was never any good at it, but I liked it. But yeah, it's, it's, Pokemon Go is having the same impact. And a lot of developers are looking at this and going, AR is the next thing. We can get in on this. But, and here's where we have our big but. Not just mine, but in terms of the story. Pokemon. <laughs> Gotta get letters. Pokemon Go. Would we get less letters if I said Kardashian? <laughs> Pokemon Go made some missteps that were easily foreseen, potentially avoidable, and they gave no shits. Let's start with the fact what you were talking about. Uh, Niantic, the basis of Pokemon Go's world map is not new. No. It's actually based in a previous game that Niantic created, which is called Ingress. Go Team Blue. And the problem with reusing this data was that Ingress was a much smaller game. It did not yes. get the, the millions that Pokemon does just from the Pokemon franchise name recognition. That's led to some fucking problems. Like, for example, Illinois National Guard bans Pokemon Go players from properties. Uh, I will state, in addition to this, the Navy has banned Pokemon Go playing on bases. Or at what? least that's the email we got. <laughs> What's happened is, because they reused the data from the previous game, Lots of locations have automatically been designated as Pokestops and Poke Gyms. Some of these locations probably should not have been designated. Yes. Places like the Pentagon, places like the White House, places like Arlington National Cemetery, places like Holocaust Museum. a Holocaust Museum. And I want to point out how this particularly collided in a special way. Um, there is a section of the Holocaust Mo Museum designated the Helena Rubinstein Auditorium. Helena Rubinstein was one of the many Jews who was killed in the gas chamber. Guess what popped up in the Helena Rubinstein Auditorium? Okay, so... Because I don't really know Pokemon, I'm going to assume that it's something extremely inappropriate and fire-based. Gas-based, actually. Okay, I didn't know they had gas-based. If I did, I would have guessed that. Oh, I'll show you the, the picture. Ah. Uh, uh, yeah. It's a happy little gas-based thing. So this is the first problem AR developers need to keep in mind going forward. Opt in, not opt, and th th I would say not opt out, but there is no opt out. 
there is currently in Pokemon Go no sort of mechanism for property owners, for business owners, for anyone to say, I do not wish for this location, which I own, which is private property, to be part of your AR game. The only, I think, except for that is you can designate a spot as dangerous and yeah. they view it and they you remove. Because when I was playing Ingress, uh, someone had made a spot out in the middle of the harbor as an ingress spot because they could get past the gated area to the harbor and get in a boat and go out there and take the spot. But no one else could. Hmm. That kind of thing I would mark as dangerous. Dangerous is one thing, but there's this, and that's the other thing. Opt out is not viable. Opt out means you have the person who owns the place has to be aware of the game, has to be aware of their significance in the game, and has to have be able to keep track of these sorts of things. How how is the how are people supposed to be able to track whether you've been included in an AR game, whether you know it or not? Yeah. Now, if it's the case where you know some random coffee shop is included in the game, and and you know the people going there playing Pokemon increase business for the game. They probably increase business for the store. They probably won't mind so much. They might question where all this extra business has suddenly come from, but it, 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 you know it's a trade-off. And I'll note on the other side of the coin, there are a handful of terribly, terribly amusing ones, such as the Westboro Baptist Church. Yeah, but is a Pokemon stop, and they keep losing. Even even though that may be amusing, it's still presumptive. It's still a developer saying. This belongs to us. We are allowed to make use of your world for our profit. And that's troublesome. And I guarantee you, as AR gets bigger and these sorts of games continue, there are going to be legal challenges to this. It's going to be messy. Because developers have this mindset of move fast and break things. Famously, I believe Steve Jobs coined that term. Stopping to take time to consider implications, especially when it comes to the vast shovelware that hits the app markets. Have you ever gone through the app market and seen just how much crap is on there? I have when I've been looking for a very specialized apps and going, okay, I need, and this is a real world example. I needed a spirit level app, you know, a little mm -hmm. bubble level mm -hmm. uh, for my phone to test if something was level or not. Right. Obviously. And I said, I went through 15 apps finding one that said no special permissions required because the first 14 or so said, we need access to your pictures, your Wi Fi, your. I'm like, why do you need all this crap for a spirit level? And, and now, okay, take that and apply that because that, that is a side effect of the app boom, where everyone was making apps for the next thing. Everyone makes apps. Now take that and apply that to AR games. There are going to be thousands, if not tens of thousands, of horrible, shitty shovelware app games just thrown onto the markets without any regard for, and they're not gonna stop to consider things like, you know, opt in, opt out. They're not gonna, they're, they're not gonna consider this. They're just gonna be like, we're gonna make some fucking money as quick as fucking possible. Yeah. And if we're well, they're, they're, they're going to have to do I say the only thing stopping them is they're going to have to have some sort of map to work off of and some sort of point set to work off of, which Niantic may well say, OK, you want to license our map slash point set. Here's the rules you must follow. Who knows? But it's not like it's it'd be hard. the hard part of building your own map point set is you got to start. You're starting with a small user base. Hmm. So. I, I, I see where you're going, but I, I don't know that it's going to take off as much as it it would have to be. Someone would ha someone would have to illicitly license the, 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 the location set. Or they're going to just randomly generate one, which could yeah. be even worse. There's no regulation against it. Yeah, because they could then put, uh, you know, random set location. Oh, that's on train tracks. 
And there's there's no regulation against it, which is that's corporate speak for if it's ain't illegal, let's do it. Make some money. Um, opt out is presumptive, even if opt opt in should be the default for AR games. Give someone a chance to be part of it. Entice them to do so. Because let, let's let's let, let's imagine that instead of uh, of this this you have to know about the game and you have to know about your significance of the game to get out of the game. Let's imagine if Pokemon Go had said, hey, Best Buy, hey, McDonald's, hey, Starbucks, we got this big Pokemon game out. You know the Pokemon name, it's part of the franchise, it's huge. Do you want your stores to be automatically included in this and maybe we can do some like promotional giveaways or whatnot and what about we do this? I think that would have been a little less presumptive and maybe a little better all around in terms of synergy marketing and such. Well, since you brought it up, Pokemon Go is partnering with McDonald's. In Asia. Ah, okay, it is in Asia. In one Hasn't period. been announced anywhere else yet. Okay. So it'll it'll hit the US eventually. Yeah, but that should ha that should have been the basis for building these places, not just saying we can use this because no one told us we couldn't. Well, I think Ingress did that with Starbucks. If the number of Starbucks again, but the entire basis of the game, of the board, of all these stops is no one told us we couldn't, so we're just going to go ahead and do it. That's presumptive. That's dangerous. Mm. That's not how you should be doing these things. The, the, this, the, the implications going forward, it has to be a lot more careful. And that's not the only problems. Um, the other issues are it's sucking up a whole lot of data on users. Oh, absolutely. It's keeping track of where you go. And in some cases, I believe looking at browser history and other stuff on your phone. Okay. So there was there was that story uh, earlier this week about or last late last week about uh, the Android I mean, the Apple version of it having all sorts of permissions and having all sorts of access. And it turns out, no, it doesn't. It didn't say it didn't have those things, but it didn't really have it. And the Pokemon people have said, no, we don't have access to that. We're going to make that explicitly clear that we don't have access to that. Um, but regardless, it is tracking a lot of data off your phone. Oh, yes. That is not something a game needs to do. That that there's nothing in the game that would require them to know where you are, when you are at all times and keep a well, keep a GPS record feature. of it. Yeah, but keep a record of it. Keep a stockpile of it. Especially considering some, most of these people playing the a lot of kids playing the game are kids. They are minors. Yeah. Who could be problematic in the future who don't have the legal authority to authorize that sort of thing or engage in those sort of, of agreements. They're minors. Yeah, I know one family, uh, the kids uh, play Pokemon Go, but they don't have Wi-Fi or GPS enabled devices. They have to go around with the parent who enables a hotspot that they traverse everything through. That's so the they only get to go out and do it with their parents. That's the responsible way of doing it, but we're really going to count on the responsibility of parents. And the amusing thing about that family is the oldest son is the only one who doesn't have a Pikachu. He is pissed. But the other thing is, the other problematic thing, and this does not just apply to Pokemon, this applies to everything. The other problematic thing with sweeping up all this data and holding on to it is... Hackers. Bingo. You, if, you were pretty much saying... It's with hacking these days, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And I have not yet seen a company that has satisfactorily secured their data against the kind of intrusion that would just let that all. And all of these accounts are attached to email addresses, which are yeah. attached to people, which. It depends are, on their level of encryption and security. And yeah. I'll be. Niantic, to be honest, as Niantic as a Google spin-off branch out, whatever the hell it mm -hmm. is exactly, I'm not yeah. one hundred percent clear. I would think given the high profile ones among their corporate competitors, 
that they're probably more up to speed on security than Sony was. But it's hard to be less up to speed on security. <laughs> than Sony. Yeah. Yeah, Sony was bad. Sony was very bad at that. There are still people who are writing PhD dissertations in computer security on how screwed up Sony was. And I think the last most egregious thing about Pokemon Go is something that's becoming an industry standard, and in this case is really, really shitty of them. What's that? The Binding Arbitration! Ah, I didn't even notice that was in there, to be honest. Pokemon Go includes, as part of its terms of service, a binding arbitration agreement. If you guys don't know what binding arbitration is, and I'll, I'll point out to you, this is completely 100% legal. Binding arbitration is where you agree that if you have a problem with a company, you cannot take them to court. What happens instead is you have to go to an arbitration board. Arbitration board. Or, or arbitration person. Arbitration person. These are third parties which are hired by the company you have a problem with. What did you do, Mike? I hear, I'm I hear, check. Yeah, yes. I, hear, I hear the sirens. They're, yeah, they're just going past. Okay. There's a lot of them. Well, I've got a hospital about um, half a mile down the street, so. In any event, binding arbitration means the company you have a problem with hires someone to decide if they did something wrong. Now, if you already see a little bit of a conflict of interest there, that's because you're not an idiot. And the other issue with binding arbitration is the arbitrators, the people who work for the arbitration boards, there's independent arbitrators, sort of have a revolving door thing going on where I, they worked for Sony for some point in time. Oh, I'm not going to be a binding arbit. I'm not going to quit Sony and be a binding arbitrator type person, hmm. the arbitration board person. Oh, here's a Sony case. Uh, I finished being a binding arbitration person. I'm now going to go work for uh, Time Warner. Uh, I finished working for Time Warner for a couple of years. I'm not going to go back to being a binding arbitration person. Oh, here's a binding arbitration case against Time Warner. Or not necessarily in that order. It's not necessarily that. Yeah. Like, it might be worked, worked for Sony, arbitrator, worked, you know, did a Time Warner case. Now I'm going to go work for Time Warner. Now they come back and they do a case for Sony. Then they go off and work for someone else, come back. You know, it's, it, it is a revolving and it is an issue. Um, the uh, federal, uh, what, what's, what's that government agency? The um, FCC? The consumer, no, the consumer. The oh, consumer yeah, the agency. new one that Warren was responsible for. Yes, the consumer agency is looking at this. Um, but as usual, the asshats in Congress are saying, uh, trying to put a bill forward saying they can't spend money looking at arbitration clauses. Yeah. Uh, 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 President Obama is almost certain to veto that. Well, he would be if they hadn't gone on a three-week recess because of, or three months, or I don't know. They, they're gone for a while. Come on back, Mike. We, Come on back. A bit. Come on back. Thing. Um, in this case, it's particularly egregious because lots of kids are playing Pokemon Go. Kids don't have the legal authority to enter into contracts like this. And for another and, thing, this is a game that encourages people to go out into the real world where they could potentially have misfortune. And the courts will not get to decide whether Pokemon Go is liable for that or whether Niantic is liable for that because it will be shifted to an arbitration board. Not necessarily because mm. a court could rule that the arbitration clause Indeed, the whole contract is invalid because the kid didn't have the authority to possible. make it and then kick it back to the courts. Possible. That is perfectly possible. But it's still, it's a shitty thing to do. It's its a shitty behavior. But again, corporates, it's like, is it legal or is it not illegal? Then let's do it. It's a sad sign of the times. In any event, yes, Pokemon Go is a good game. I have no problem with it. It's charming. But why did it have to do all this other stuff? Why, what, what, why did all these other things have to get loaded on top of it that, that have caused issues? These are things AR developers going forward as more and more AR games become popular should take into consideration. Whether yep. they will or not, 
we don't know. But I think I think they eventually will. I think it will take a game, a, a second game, doing something even shadier mm. and getting slammed hard for. Because I don't. What I view on Niantic and Pokemon Go is I don't think they're going to do anything that is deliberately destructive. They're not. I mean, right. They've done some. They've done some stuff that yeah, we we're we're not fond of how they did this, but they're not going. We've made this place the most important Pokemon gym of uh, Los Angeles for the next 48 hours without talking to the person who owns the store and and screwing up that guy's life for a weekend. Yeah. Um, it's going to take another company doing something shady and or dumb, such as making multiple points on a train track or something and getting people run over. Or even better, um, it, pictures. And not doing anything about it and to get... Congress to do something, or a state government to do something. Picture this scenario. A game that designate that is requires multiple people to be at the same location at the same time for interaction purposes. If they encourage, if the game encourages, say, 100 people to go to one location for a game at a specific time, could that potentially constitute harassment of the property owner? Well, Niantic did that with Ingress. They had events where you would have a site, which would usually have multiple Ingress um, locations there. Uh, that would be very important. You know, you're trying to get an object from a point A to point B sort of deal. I and mean, that was never involved. I don't know all the details. Uh, and it'd be whoever controlled the portal when the object hit there was the one who got to move it next, the team, you know, you know and things like that. So you would have 100 or 200 or something people involved in something like that but it would generally in their case be a park mm. or things like that public locations um but yeah no, i know i see where your concern is i'm just I, it's going to take someone doing something like say shady and dumb and as we've all seen with app development to this point shady and dumb is par for the course yeah Let's move on. Uh, I'm only going to do one more story because we're running out of time tonight. Um, okay. I wanted to mention, uh, by the way, this is sort of related to it. Mr. Robot has come back. This is a fantastic show. It, it, I haven't watched it. I think I'll start watching the first season see if it clicks on me. For a, for, it's great for a lot of reasons. Not only is it well acted, well directed, well written. I have some issues with it. But it's, it's still fantastic. The best part is it is the most technically perfect in terms of how they portray computers hacking. You said technically accurate. Accurate, rather. yeah, accurate. It is, it's fantastic. They get everything right. And in the premiere of the second season, where, where we're leading into the story, kind of is a wonderful indictment of the Internet of Things. It's a, a person has a smart home, Oh, it gets just showing how that putting all of the things in your home on the internet is it's a bad idea. Really bad idea. Unless you've got really good security. And the problem with that, by the way, just while Nash is bringing up the story, the problem with good security is with an internet of things, you're trusting other people's security. Mm, yeah, unless you. I can, I can configure my firewall the way I need to because it has those options. I can't configure a firewall on a smart light bulb very easily. Because they didn't build one in. Yeah. Well, uh, this is sort of related to that. Um, not to the hacking part of it, but to the Internet of Things part of it. What happens when all these wonderful smart connected devices you have are no longer supported by the manufacturer? Yeah, and, and it's a problem. So in, in this case, we're talking about Nest. Yeah. But in, in for, for anything, so let's go, let's go to the smart light bulb real quick. Smart light bulb, the idea behind it, you know, Internet controlled light bulb do all sorts of crazy things with it. Yes. The idea is they're long lasting because you don't want to replace a smart connected light bulb every, right. every month. And uh, inexpensive enough because a light bulb is supposed to be a, a commodity item. You're not supposed to sit there and go, I'm dropping $3,000 in a light bulb unless you're a football stadium. Yeah. Um, so when you go low price point, long life, there's a, a, a tendency to go, well, we've made upgrades in it, but we can't really push out the upgrades to the existing ones. We can only put it in the new ones. So we don't give a crap about the existing ones. And then there's issues. 
Yeah. In this case, uh, Nest had released the Revolve Hub. It was supposed to be a smart hub that was connecting for all of these Internet of Things devices. Then they stopped supporting it. Just, and not even any real warning either. It was one week. Yeah, yeah, sure. Here you go. Uh, here's how you fix this issue. Next week, it is end of life. We are no longer putting out patches or answering questions. Or even maintaining the server that it connected to. Yeah, and that was the difficult part because you didn't log into the hub directly. You logged into the hub through their server. As a result of that, it means this device, this rather expensive little device they sold to lots and lots of people, was now effectively useless. It yes. could do nothing. It was no, it could no, because the company maintained a vital component of it that needed to be active at all times. Like an MMO game. If an MMO yes. game shuts down its servers, game's over. Well, even if it's a non-MMO game, there's plenty of games that require server connections uh, where they go, yeah, we're shutting down the server. Oh, you mean you can't play your single-person basketball game anymore because we've shut down our servers? Yep. Sucks to be you. And in this case, this is getting to be a little bit more of a problem because this isn't just a game. These are services and devices that are connected all throughout your home. The FTC is looking into these sort of things. Yeah, um, they closed this case because uh, Ness said, we will refund the money of everyone who bought one of these because not too many re people really bought one of these yeah. compared to their other products. But it was a test case in this scenario. And suppose Philips has sold thousands of those smart light bulbs. They're Hue light bulbs. Just imagine if tomorrow they, this lack of support of them, if they just drop the servers and whatever, you would have thousands of people with light bulbs that no longer worked. That is something that has to... That, and the problem is these companies with the Internet of Things have tried to blend physical objects with services without there's no clear delineation with, between these two and no real thought as to how they're going to continue that when it's not cost effective anymore but there's still lots out there yeah it, it's this this weird meshing that we have of where Items can go obsolete, not because they stop functioning, but because a company just decides to switch off the server on the Internet. Yeah. This is going to be something, and again, if you are interested in the Internet of Things kind of stuff... This wait. is something to pay attention to. Yeah. Because this model of shutting off the servers, it's, um, it's basically the Ubisoft model. Yeah. Fucking Ubisoft. In any event, if you're interested in investing in any of these sort of devices, right now, don't. We are yeah. still in the woods on this. We, we are off any sort of map when it comes to this sort of thing. The only exception, unless you, you go, I really, really want to play with this. I want to, I want to do this. I want to become a, a home automation uh, blogger or caster about yeah. this and talk about the problems in it. You know, there's probably a niche out there for that. But just understand that what you're purchasing today may be useless as soon as next week. This is yeah. still a very volatile market, and we have to wait for a lot of things to play out, a lot of court cases to be considered, a lot of government to have to look in on these things and determine consumer rights in these areas. This is very much a whole new ballgame. Do you know what I see? being one of the things possibly coming out of the Internet of Things for your home? Oh, God, what? Uh, you know how you can go to a various company and say, I want solar panels on my roof, or I want vinyl siding on my on my exterior walls. I want a Faraday cage for my house so that people can't hack into my Internet of Things from the street. It might come to that. It seriously might come to that. And if it does, I, I thought of it first. <laughs> Probably not, but uh, <laughs> so, there's someone, someone wearing a tinfoil hat and just going to Faraday cage from my house. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. So now that we've covered the stories, it's time to look at your questions. Again, if you have stuff you might like for us to help you with, 
You can send those questions to request at radio.air.com. We have a couple we will be able to help you with tonight, and a couple... Oh, fuck. I'm sorry, but that is one of the aspects of tech. Sometimes it's just, oh, fuck. Yeah. Let's start with an easy one. Um, this one comes from Zach. And there's not, well, Zach a lot of, not a lot of info here, but I think we can help you. Even with this little... In, um, hey, I have a computer problem. My computer screen is purple tinted. This happens on multiple monitors. I've seen this at work. I, I think I know exactly what the problem Go is. Go for it. And I think it is your monitor cable. And I've Because we, we bought a bunch of brand new monitors a few years ago at work. Because someone saw that flat 24-inch flat panels are really cheap and decided to get rid of all the CRTs. Saves on our end, heating and cooling bills as well. Well, our cooling bill. Um, and we hook them all up after we deliver them. And a guy says, hey, my computer's purple. And I go, that is purple. Swap out a different cable and it goes right away. There are a lot of cheap cables out there. And the cheap cables sometimes have dropped pins and dropped color sequence information. And that's what happens. Yeah. Since you say it happens on multiple monitors, I'm thinking you swapped out the monitor, but not the cable. So check that. Uh, I would check the connectors themselves just to make sure that the, the, the connection is, is corrosion free. Um, but that that's my guess as to what it is. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to go with that too. See, with a, a monitor cable, what a lot of people don't know, and it's they really don't know this, each, that, that cable, is not just one solid wire. There's a bundle of cables in there. And every single wire in there corresponds to a specific function between your monitor and your computer. Some of them control colors. Some of them control... Uh, uh, refresh rate. Refresh rate. That each cable is assigned to... Passing data of various kinds. Right. And if one of those cables, one of those little wires in that cable snaps or breaks, well, the others, or is just, or is just even attenuated more than normal. Yeah, then you'll still get all the rest of the data going to your monitor, like the color yellow, the color blue, the color. Green. However, they're situated. However, if one of those is off, that data is not coming through, and suddenly your monitor turns purple, or green, or green, or blue, or blue. So in this case, it's one of those, one of the things in troubleshooting you need to do is look for common denominators between devices. Like in, in this case, your, your instinct was right to test this on multiple monitors. But the thing you need to look for is what was the same in each instance when you were troubleshooting between those different monitors. And in this case, I'm willing to bet it was the cable. Now, the second thing to check, by the way, when you, when you, when you get a new cable, you only need to get around a 15 or $20 cable probably. Yeah. Yeah, don't don't get Monster Brand. I mean, they make really good cables, but they charge a lot for those cables. They and charge, they don't do anything special. Yeah, they charge 100% more than anyone else for the name brand. Now, the second thing I would do is when you're buying a cable, before you go, obviously see what kind of cable you have. You know, DVI, HDMI, DisplayPort, right. whatever. See if your computer has multiple video outputs. Right. Just so you can test a different video output as well. So, you know, say it's got DVI, you got two DVIs, well, try it on the second DVI. Make sure it's not the DVI port you're plugged into. Or switch to HDMI. You know, and if you need to go HDMI to DVA, get a little adapter or dongle, that's fine. Dongle. <laughs> dongle, all right, I, I'm just a little... It's, it's a word that always makes you laugh. A little segue here. Dongle is one of the stupidest names that we've ever... Ad um, all right, in case you don't know what a dongle is, a dongle, do you have a dongle? I know, Who has I a dongle? At my desk at work, I have like a dozen. A dozen dongles. So many dongles. Dongles everywhere. A dongle is one of the, it, it pretty much looks like a plug and a plug and a little bit of a wire. Yeah, that's a dongle. Not a video dongle, obviously, but. That's a USB dongle. That is a USB to uh, PS2, isn't it? Yeah. The rest of us call them adapters, but the technical name is dongle. I don't know who did this. A madman, an engineer. I'm sure there's an engineer sitting somewhere who said, oh, we've made an adapter. No, no, we're not calling it an adapter. It's Whoa. a dongle. It's a dongle. Are you, are you, bet, are you sure it's I a dongle? I bet his last name was dongle. Are you sure we're calling that a dongle? It's a dongle. 
And so if you start typing in, why is a dongle called a dongle into Google, it auto-completes that. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that, the, okay, okay, we've named this the dongle. Uh, what's this other vital but important uh, addition to could be? We're going to call that the peeny boob. <laughs> why? Because I said so and I made it. <sighs> anyway. All right, that's one of the ones we could answer. Now let's do one of the ones that's just, ah. All right, um, this one comes to us from Russell. He says, hi, hey, Nash and Mike. Hopefully this should be an easy one to sort out. <laughs> My current PC is getting on for about five to six years old now without any mods. It's running Windows 7 Home Premium, using Firefox, and is using a USB mobile broadband dongle. God damn it, there's that word again from the UK-based telecommunication company, Three. However, I've been having some problems recently. Whenever I try to shut down the PC, the message attached to this post appears. Now, sometimes it appears, then quickly disappears. Um, sometimes I have to click on OK. Is it a fixable error? Have I done goofed up somewhere? Should I take the PC behind the shed and put her out of her misery? I'd appreciate your help. Oh, let's show everybody this, this fucking, this fuck. All right, here, have a look. This is the error. The instruction at 0xf44ad268 reference memory at 0xf42. The memory could not be written. Click on OK to terminate the program. I'm going to tell you right now, Russell. Um, Russell, I got to say, you've done something I have not seen in a long time. Mm. I type in that error number, 0xf44ad268 into Google, and I get no results. Here's, uh, this is one of the most frustrating errors to troubleshoot and correct, because it could be caused by multiple problems. What's happening here is a program is attempting to put, to reference something in RAM. That's the computer's memory. It's trying to find a specific bit of information and access it or write to that information and say, hey, we've made some changes to what's going on right now. And it can't. This can happen for so many reasons, it's ridiculous. Um, it could be because the program was badly written and there's an error in the code and it's not able to fulfill its function the way it's supposed to. It could be because you have a virus. Not always, but it is possible. It could be because the RAM in the computer is actually broken and it's not reading and writing correctly. It is so hard. It is hard as shit to track down one of these errors. Seriously, it's ridiculous. Okay. So the only thing I have to suggest is something I just found. And I have no idea whether this works. This guy claims it, it did for him. Whatever, you know, unknown device shut on shut what shut down for Windows 7. And that is power down your computer. Unplug your computer from the wall. Wait 10 minutes and then plug it back in. It's just the it, it is literally that's what he said. Uh it says it's 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 a uh it, this he's saying what it is, you, you do that, and it, it cleared it up for him. Now could that be completely coincidental? Possibly. Possibly. It could be something discharging on the mother on the motherboard goes, okay, now I need to reload some stuff. Um, quite honestly, if before you shut down, you go through uh, your device manager and look and see if it has device not recognized, um, that would be something to go, okay, well, what's yeah. this device that's not recognizing? Um, Windows does not have something I've long wanted. Uh, in startup, you can go through a step-by-step -step startup mode. We can go load this driver. Okay, that worked. Load this next driver. That worked. Load this next driver. Oh, that failed. Aha, it is this thing that's causing the failure. Windows doesn't have a step-by-step -step shutdown, which would be useful in your case. All right. Since this is related to USB device not recognized, my first recommendation for troubleshooting this issue is unplug every USB device from your computer, then attempt to shut down. If that works okay, one by one, plug those USB devices back in. Ideally, you've made a note of which port they were in so you can plug them back in the same port because once you've identified which device it is under this, you want to move that to a different port because Windows will often, not always, but often, reload the drivers yeah. 
for that device on that new port. That may correct the issue. Um, if, af if that doesn't work and it keeps doing it, I would go through and look at what else is running on your computer when, the, when you're shutting down. Because what this may be caused by something else may be interfering with it, whether it's just a badly written program or a virus, something may be interfering with Windows. Yeah, exactly. It's like the, the story I had last time where I had a uh, TV tuner card that interfered with my printer. Mm -hmm. Why? Because someone fucked up writing the drivers. Yeah, someone someone used some code that they thought was great or they just in, in, the, in the video card thing, it was just not unloading properly. And why that would interfere with the printer? I will find them. But it did. So same sort of deal. Um, Give it a try. I mean, it, it, it'd be helpful if you could identify what device it was. If realistically, I, I see you having uh, anywhere from three to five USB devices in your plugged into your machine. You've got your USB uh, Ethernet adapter you've mentioned. You've got your keyboard, your mouse, and probably a printer. And that may be about it. So you don't have a lot of stuff to go through, and it shouldn't really be the keyboard or mouse. If not, if that doesn't work, the next thing I would do is download a free utility called Memtest. Um, you can Google for that. It's M-E-M-T-E-S-T, -E Memtest. It's a free utility. What it does is it physically tests your RAM. You Now, you're going to have to block off some time for this because it takes a while to run. Ideally, you don't go, oh, I'm, <clears throat> I need to go take a shower, start Memtest, go take your shower, come back. If there are any problems with your RAM that if one of the RAM chips has an issue in it, it's going bad, Memtest will reveal it to you. That and I'll even tell you which slot it is. Yeah. So it's useful in that in that regard. And you now, may... you'll, you, will, you will have to know, by the way, when it says, oh, it's memory in slot two, you'll have to know whether your motherboard counts from zero, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four. So you replace the right one. But yeah. And finally, if Memtest doesn't find any issues, you may be looking at a system restore. Meaning uh, you, you pretty much have to, in fact, not even a system restore, I would do a reinstall because this is a six-year-old computer. Might be time. Might be time. Because Windows is, is, is kind of, even Windows 10. Builds is, up corrupt. Yeah. And you may have to just wipe and start over. I hate that we can't come up with an easy definitive answer for this because this is one of the this is one of the most frustrating things to troubleshoot. Period. Oh, yeah. yeah. When when and, and it's been that way for Windows for a long time. They've never to from my from my point of view, they've never given really good error information that no, you can just go, Oh, not. this this means this. But the, the the advent of Google, of course, means you can now plug in most of these codes and go, oh, that means this. Yeah, but not always. Uh... Anyway, so hopefully that helps. Good luck, Russell. If you, if you come up with anything else, let us know. Send us an email. Maybe we maybe we can go from there. Let's do another easy one. Um, this is from Ben. Oh, actually, let's back up to Russell real quick. Just okay. And one other thing to check, of course, is if you any of your drivers need updating. Yeah, that's yeah. This makes because sure. a Windows patch may have just said I'm not working well with this old version of this driver anymore. No. All right, let's do a simple one. This is from Ben. It's a straightforward question. Why do ISPs sell you a different upload speed that is usually inferior to your download speed? Because they're bastards. Ah, realistically, the answer is because you don't need 99% of the time the upload speed. Think about what you're doing right now out there watching this show. You're watching us talk to you about tech mm -hmm. issues. You're downloading a relatively wide band, you know, bandwidth stream uh, and maybe you're doing a search on Google but what you're not doing is sending a massive amount of information back you're sending your computer sending back I've received this amount these packets I didn't receive this one send that again uh, and and so on but you're not sending a lot of stuff comparably out into the world so they look at what the average user needs and then give you about 80 percent of that um 80 percent try 20%. Well, they, 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 for, for, for down, well, for download, they give you, they say, say, they give you much more because you're doing much more downloading. Unless you're someone like Nash, who is doing the broadcast of a show, most of the time you don't need the upload. Now, is it nice to have for when you do need it? Yes. 
it's you know when you're sending you know a, a two gig file to someone else you're going on putting this in dropbox or wherever uh, you'd like to have it not take 10 minutes to upload because you got more important shit to do well, what, what we're talking about here is the difference between an asymmetrical connection and a symmetrical connection symmetrical internet connection means your upload and download rate are the same asymmetrical means your upload and download rate are different now there is a kind of there are two reasons why companies do this the first is what what mike was saying they don't need to it's cheaper for them because they don't have to worry about all this extra upstream bandwidth so if, now you could argue that in terms of bandwidth up and down is up and down it's still a pipe that's something you are the other reason companies don't like doing this is they really, 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 really don't like you to run a server from your home. Without paying them a lot of money to be able yeah. to run a server from your home. Asymmetrical connections limit your upstream bandwidth, so you can't, say, run your own game server, or you can't even run your own website from your home computer. A home server, a home website, just off a standard commercial internet connection. They don't want you to do that. They want to charge you more to do that. Why? because they want to charge you more to do that. Now, I will point out Google Fiber has been kind of different about this. They offer a, what is it, a one, uh, one gigabit, one gigabit asymmetrical, uh, or one gigabit, one gigabit symmetrical connection. Even They even offer a 100, 100 symmetrical connection. Yeah, Google they, don't, they don't seem to care if you run a server at your house. Yeah, Google Fiber is breaking this, this, this entire philosophy. They're like, here's the bandwidth, have fucking fun. And I'm pretty sure that Comcast and, and uh, Charter and the other cable ISPs in America are really pissed off about that because that means competition. And they want to keep charging you more to run a server, but Google is offering you this, to, and they hate that. So that's, that's kind of how that works. Yeah. Let's do another one that's going to make me pull my fucking hair out. The Steam. Ah, Steam. This comes from Matt. Hi, Nash and Mike. Thanks a lot for doing your shows. I wanted to see if you could help me with an issue running the Steam client on Windows 7. Oh, whoa. I'm getting a lot of static on your end, Mike. Um, okay. Is that any better? It was. Uh, I haven't changed anything, so unless something is currently dying. There's something brushing your mic? Not that I can see. Your mic is just crackling like crazy. And now it's fine again. Anyway. Okay. All right. Hi, Nash and Mike. Thanks a lot for doing your shows. I wanted to see if you could help me with an issue running the Steam client on Windows 7. Haven't been able to open. I've been unable to open it for a long time. Said I get a series of windows updating Steam connected to account, but then nothing. In Task Manager, I can see this at this point. A process called Steam Error Reporter.exe has opened and then disappears as well. I've tried many methods and followed the typical guess and check guides I could find. My only clues with Windows Safe Mode. In Safe Mode with networking, the client works just fine. However, when I followed a guy to do a selective startup without all non-Windows programs, the client did not work. Uh, and he's got a list here of uh, delete the client files and run Steam, reinstall Steam, remove St registry Steam entities, uh, entries and reinstall, selective startup and reinstall. I have bad news for you, Matt. And the clue here is the fact that you were able to get it to work under safe mode, but not after you Regular. did a yeah um the reason you did selective startup and uh when you do a selective startup you can tell windows which programs to run and you stopped all non-windows programs from running so that rules out any other programs interfering with steam that, that, that we're running at startup okay um that rules out other programs with steam that we're running with startup the problem here is I'm willing to bet something in Windows is goofy. Matt says, lastly, if you have to recommend an OS reinstall, I understand, but is there a way to prevent having to take, spend another use of a product key? I've already used three out of five of my Adobe CS5 installs, and that would be lame to have to do again. Uh, yes, you can uh, 
deregister Adobe CS. A lot of companies where you have to use registration keys have this as an option because they know you have to rebuild systems occasionally. Yeah. Uh, there, many of them even have this option after a critical meltdown. You go, oh, my computer melted down. I need to reuse this key. They're understanding mm. about that at least once or twice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in general, I'd say, sadly, again, and this is one of the wonderful problems with Windows, I, I really think there's some Windows component we cannot identify based on what you, you've covered all the bases on Steam. You, you did a good job in troubleshooting and taking care of anything that was possibly Steam related. But there's something in Windows that's just not playing nice anymore. Now, Mike did mention your firewall. You could check your firewall settings and see if something is there. But the fact that you're getting the Steam error reporter popping up. Now, if you can find out if that Steam error reporter is writing any files on your computer that you can go, this is the error report, maybe that would give you something further to track down. I don't know if it does that. That would be useful information. But in, in this regard, my gut instinct is saying you're looking at another reinstall. I'm so sorry. That it's, it's a nasty sort of thing to do, but you're looking at a reinstall. I'm sorry, dude. Um, well, all right. That that's. I hate the ones we have to say you have to reinstall Windows because God, that's a pain yeah. in the ass. But it, sometimes with with Windows, it's so interconnected and so dense and so hard to pick out individual parts and pieces to fix. That reinstalls often are the only option. It's a pain in the ass, but it's the truth. Um, well, that's all right. That that's going to just about do it for us tonight. We're running a little over at this point. Um, if you have questions for us for next time, we'll be back in two weeks. Send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. Put tech Q and A in the subject line. Mike and I will attempt to hopefully not tell you to reinstall your operating system, but Mike <laughs> and I will attempt to find solutions for your issues. Um, in the meantime, folks, have a good night. We'll see you next time.